Okay, here we go with lecture five. This is going to be a particularly short lecture to finish off chapter one. Okay, and then when we get into chapter two, it'll be more mathematically based stuff. Okay, so we're going to talk today about how to design an experiment just on the surface level. We're not going to go terribly deep. Okay, but in an experiment, the the purpose is to figure out how one variable can affect another variable. And I don't just mean variable like a letter standing for a number. I mean variable is something that you can change. Okay? So in an experiment, you have two variables. Well, you might have a lot more, and that's part of the problem. You want to try to narrow it down to two or as few as possible. Okay? And you have the variable that you manipulate, and then you measure how much does that change the other variable, okay? So you have one, here, let me actually say it like this, changes in one variable, cause changes in the other variable. Okay? All right, now, the variable that causes the change has a name. a second here let me get this written down so the so the variable that causes the change in the other variable okay that's called the independent variable or some people call it explanatory variable. But that's not nearly as common of a name. Most people call it independent variable. Okay? And then the variable that is affected by the independent variable it's called the dependent variable. Okay, that's called the dependent variable. And that has another less common name, which is response variable. Okay, so an example might be you're testing some performance enhancing drugs for athletes. Okay? So then the independent variable would be the drugs. How much they take. Let's just say steroids, okay? The independent variable would be the steroids. How much the athlete takes. And then the dependent variable would be, you know, some sort of a measure of how strong they are or how fast they can run or something like that. 
you would decide beforehand what you're going to measure. You know, are you measuring speed or strength or whatever? Okay, so your independent variable would be how much of the steroids they take, and the dependent variable would be their performance, their physical performance. And you would try to see how different amounts of the steroids affect the physical performance. Okay? Now, in that, each individual or each object that is being measured is called an experimental unit. So each, let's just say person or object participating in the experiment and being measured is called an experimental unit. Okay? And in the experiment, there are different values that you would use of the independent variable. Okay, and each of those is called a treatment. So each value of the independent variable is called a treatment. Okay, now let's move on from there. We need to avoid something which are called lurking variables. And what those are is, those are additional variables that can affect the dependent variable, okay? These are additional variables that can affect the independent variable okay and what that can do is that can mask or artificially in or uh, artificially um, you know increase the perceived effect of the oh by the way I used the wrong word I'm sorry the lurking variables are additional variables that can affect the dependent variable not independent they affect the dependent variable and they tend to mask or artificially increase the perceived effect of the independent variable. Okay, let me write that down and then I'll explain. To mask or increase, artificially increase
he perceived effect of the independent variable. Okay, so let me just give you an example. Um, you know, a lot of times when you have medication or drugs, you know, a lot of times there's other ingredients in there. Like, for instance, if you get a flu shot, they always ask you if you're allergic to eggs because they use eggs, chicken eggs, I believe it is, to, um, I don't know what you call it, incubate or, or if you want to call it that, the, um, the flu virus in order to make the flu vaccine. Okay? And so an egg allergy would affect your um, acceptance, your body's acceptance of a flu vaccine. You see, so if you were studying, if you're studying this flu vaccine to see, let's say you were studying to see not how well it does as a flu vaccine, but you were just wanting to find out if there are side effects. Let's just say you wanted to find out, does this flu vaccine make the patient nauseous? Okay then an egg allergy would be a lurking variable because um, if somebody had an egg allergy and you gave them this vaccine, they would get nauseous from the fact that they're allergic to the eggs that are in the vaccine. And so you might, you might say, oh, you know, the, the, actual, the actual medicine there is, is not good for that person. It's making them nauseous. When really, that's not the case. It makes it look like the medicine made them nauseous, when really, it's just the eggs that are also present. You see what I'm saying? So that's what's called a lurking variable. And we need to try to avoid those as best we can. It's, it's my impression, my, my way of thinking about it is that it's impossible to entirely avoid all lurking variables. But we try to rule out as many as we can. And we also try to minimize as much as possible the ones that we cannot rule out. Okay? And one way of minimizing lurking variables some of them is what's called a control group okay so let me write this down let me let me give you an example okay this is in the book on page 30 okay so it says that they were testing some performance enhancing drugs on some athletes and I'm going to read this straight out of the book. It says, results showed that believing one had taken the substance re resulted in performance times almost as fast as those associated with consuming the drug itself. In contrast, taking the drug without knowledge yielded no significant performance increase. So what that means is that they tested people they're talking about performance times okay so this is a timed event let's just let's just suppose that it's they're testing how fast you can run uh, 100 meters okay and so what they're saying here is that if you took a person and you timed their speed before giving them this, let's just say steroids okay it's easier than saying performance enhancing drugs so if you timed somebody before giving them the steroids and then you timed them after the steroids, okay? And let's, let's say you saw that they're faster after taking the steroids. What they're saying in this sentence, though, is that if you took another athlete and you did not give them the steroids, but they thought that you did, then their, their times also improved 
by the same amount as the as the athletes who took the steroids. Okay? That's called a placebo effect. The fact that they think they took the steroids, so they expect to run faster, actually made them run faster. Okay? And here's the other the other side of the coin, which is which is just as weird, even weirder in my opinion, is that if you took a person and you timed them and then you did not give them the steroids and then you timed them a second time and they knew that they did not take the steroids they just you just said i want you to run this twice and i'm going to time you the first time and the second time okay and then you took a group of people and you timed them running one time and then you gave them the steroids but told them that you didn't and then had them run again their second time was not any faster than the first time even though they were given the steroids because they thought that they had not been given the steroids okay so that's a very that's a very strange situation okay and that's so so that's called the placebo effect okay a placebo is like a fake treatment it's like you give someone a they used to call these sugar pills you give them a pill that's just sugar i always wondered how could people not recognize it by the taste you know sugar tastes a certain way but the point is you give them a pill and it's not really the pill that they think they're taking it's just it's just sugar okay that's called a placebo okay and so what you do to avoid this effect, okay, is you establish what's called a control group, okay? So let's write this down. So this is, this is to, um, to try to avoid Here, let me reword that. No, that's okay. We can keep that, but I'm going to just change what I was going to say next. Uh, to try to avoid the confounding effects of the power of suggestion. So like in what I was just talking about a minute ago. Whether the athlete thought they took the steroids or not ended up being just as important as whether they actually did or not. That's what's called the power of suggestion, okay? And so in order to try to avoid the confounding effects of the power of suggestion, okay, we, um, we set one treatment group that means one group of experimental subjects okay we set one aside but we don't tell them that we're doing this okay and call them the control group Okay, and that group is given a placebo treatment. Which basically means they're not giving any treatment at all, but they think that they are. Okay, and what that does for you is it helps it helps to point out the effects caused by the experiment itself, just the very fact of being in the experiment. Okay, so in, going back to our group of these runners testing the steroids, you know, if you 
if you gave a bunch of the, if you gave one group the steroids and then found out that they're faster, then at first you think, oh, the steroids make them faster. But then you take the control group and you tell the control group that you're giving them the steroids, but you're really not. Let's just say you're giving them an injection of saline solution. Okay. And then they run faster. Then now you say, oh, well, it might not have been the steroids that made the first people faster. It's just the fact that they knew they were taking steroids. That's just the power of suggestion. Okay, so they expected to be faster, and so they found that they were able to run faster. Okay? And it's very important now that you assign the experimental individuals randomly to the control group and the non-control group. Okay? Because obviously if you don't do it randomly, then you might be embedding other lurking uh, variables. Like you wouldn't take all of the strong, fast-looking people and put them in the steroid group and then take all of the slow, weak-looking people and put them in the control group. That wouldn't be very good because then if the if the people who got the steroids then showed an improvement and the control group did not show an improvement, you don't know if it was actually the steroids that caused the improvement or just the fact that the people who got the steroids were in better physical shape to begin with. You see what I'm saying? So random assignment is very important and the random assignment into the different groups helps to eliminate the effect of the lurking variables that you can't get rid of, okay? I, I think there will always be some lurking variables that you can't get rid of, and so the ones that you can't get rid of, you try to eliminate their influence by assigning the um, experimental individuals to the groups randomly, and what that does is, if there are other lurking variables that you can't get rid of, at least it spreads those lurking variables out across the different groups, okay, so that they don't cause um, a built-up effect on any one group, okay? All right, last uh, subject is called blinding, and you've probably heard people mention a blind experiment and a double-blind experiment, okay? So an experiment... where the participants do not know what group they're in or what treatment they're receiving is called a blind experiment. And it's very important to do that whenever you can, but it's not always possible. Okay? Now, what's a double-blind experiment? If the experimenters also don't know what group the participants are in. Or let's say what group each participant is in. Okay, or what treatment
they are administering. Then the experiment is called double blind. Now, you might say, how could the experimenter not know what treatment they're administering? So here's how that would work. To give you an example, let's go back to the running, uh, the effects of a speed, um, sorry, the effects of the steroids on a person's speed. So you can make that a blind experiment by, you know, having two groups a group that receives steroids and then a control group that does not. Okay, so you have a group of people that are given the steroids and a group of people that aren't. Okay, let's keep it simple and just leave it at that. Okay, if you don't tell the people whether they're going to get the steroids or not, then you have a blind experiment. So you, you give everybody an injection but let's say half of them, the injection is the steroids, and the other half it's just saline solution. Okay, and you don't tell the you don't tell the athletes if they're getting the the real injection or the fake one. Then you have a blind experiment. Now let's talk about how could you make that double blind? How could the person giving the injections not know which one they're giving? So the way you would do that is the person running the experiment would fill up half of the syringes with steroids and half of the syringes with saline solution. And that person knows who is in each group, okay? But that person never interacts with the athletes at all. They have some, some people working for them. And, and the person running the experiment gives a tray of syringes with the steroids in it to one worker and says give this injection to those group of people. The worker doesn't know if they're injecting the steroids or the saline solution. Okay, And then they give another tray to that same worker or another one and they say now give the, take these syringes and give these injections to that other group of people. So somebody obviously does have to know which syringes are real and which aren't. But the point is that that person would never be interacting with the test subjects. The people who do interact with the te test subjects do not know if they're administering the real treatment or the placebo treatment. Okay, and that's called double blind. And why would you need to do that? Just because you know, um, the the person delivering the injections, they might accidentally um, give some sort of a clue if the, um, if the syringe has the steroids or the saline solution. You know, like, um, they might walk into the, to the testing room and say, um, Okay, so there might be some side effects from the steroids, but uh, but this group doesn't need to worry about side effects. Okay, well then that would ruin the blindness of the experiment because then that group would know that they aren't really getting the steroids. You see, so in order to avoid those kinds of accidents, it's better if the people administering the treatments don't even know if they're administering the treatments or not. That's called a double blind experiment. Okay, now let's finish off by looking at an example. Taking this right out of the book here. Give me one second. This is example 1.19 on page 30. Okay, it says, you're trying to investigate whether smell can affect learning. The subjects are going to be asked to complete mazes with a pencil on paper multiple times 
while wearing masks. And there's unscented masks and floral scented masks. And the goal is to try to see if the floral scent will affect how fast they can learn how to do a maze. Okay? So they complete the pencil and paper mazes three times wearing floral scented masks and three times with unscented masks. Participants were assigned at random to wear the floral mask during the first three trials or during the last three. So you have two groups, okay, of people and one group wears the floral scented mask first and does three mazes and then they wear an unscented mask and does three mazes. That's one group. The other group wears the unscented masks and do, does three mazes and then they wear the floral scented masks and do three mazes. And your goal is to just measure and see if there's any difference between how fast they can figure out the mazes depending on if they're wearing the floral scented mask or not. Okay? It says, for each trial, researchers recorded the time it took to complete the maze and the subject's impression of the mask's scent, positive, negative, or neutral. So, you're, you're, it's, not, it's not if you're trying to figure out if there's something magical about floral scent. It's that you're trying to figure out if they like the scent, do they do the mazes faster? If they don't like the scent, do they do them slower? And things like that. Okay, so let's think about this. It says, describe the explanatory and response variables, or the independent and dependent variables. So let's think about that. What's the independent variables? They are unscented mask versus floral scented mask. That's the independent variable. Okay? And what's the dependent variable? How fast they do the mazes. Okay? What are the treatments? The treatments are uh, scented or unscented. Okay? Okay, it says this. Identify any lurking variables that could interfere with the study. Okay, now, this is what it says in the book. It says, all subjects experienced both treatments, and the order of the treatments was randomly assigned, so there's no differences between control groups. Random assignment eliminates the problem of lurking variables. Okay, I agree with that. However, there's part of the question that they didn't answer. Actually, to be honest with you, they didn't answer the question at all of what was asked. What they said is correct, and it's a very intelligent statement, and it's important. The fact that you assign people randomly to the two groups, um, it says eliminates the problem of lurking variables. I would have said um, minimizes the problem of lurking variables. I'm not sure it's possible to entirely eliminate it. But the, but the thing is that that's not the question they asked. The question said, identify what the lurking variables are that could interfere with the study. So I thought of one. Maybe somebody has a skin condition and wearing a mask on their face causes them to develop a rash. Okay? then the longer they have a mask on, the more uncomfortable they're going to be, and that probably will affect their performance. So if you have somebody who has an allergic skin condition, no matter which treatment they received second, they would perform worse with that treatment even though it has nothing to do with the scent of the mask. It has to do with their skin condition. Okay? And you can't 
you can't uh, eliminate that entirely, but you can minimize the effect of that by assigning people to the two groups randomly. So if there are some people with sensitive skin who are going to develop a rash from the masks, in theory, those people would be assigned randomly. Some of them would have the scented mask second and not do as well for that because they're uncomfortable because of the rash that they're developing. But also other people who might have sensitive skin would have the unscented mask second. And so they would tend to cancel each other out. Okay. All right, last question. Is it possible to use blinding in this study? Well, in this case, no, it's not. I, I can't think of a way, and, and the book says the same thing, that how are you going to make it so that the, the um, people participating in an experiment don't know if they're wearing a plain mask or a scented mask? Uh, that's impossible, right? They can smell the mask, and, and so they'll know which one they're wearing first and which one they're wearing second. So blinding is not possible in this case, okay? It is possible for the researchers to not know. They could deliver the masks to the subjects in Ziploc bags. So the researchers can't, can't smell them and they won't know if there's a scent or not. Okay. But that would not be called double blind. And it, in fact, it wouldn't even be called blind because the word blind, a blind study, refers to the participants, not the researchers. Okay, if the participants are blind, not literally blind, but you know what I mean, I defined it for you, then it's called a blind experiment. And then if also the researchers are blind, then it's called a double blind experiment. If the participants are not blinded and the researchers are, uh, I don't believe there's a special word for that. But that would be the case in this particular example. Okay, that brings us to the end of chapter one. Um, so I hope it was informative, but I'm kind of glad in a way to be done with this chapter so that we can actually get into doing some math in the next chapter. But we have no lecture or office hours on Monday because it's a national holiday. I forgot which one. It was Labor Day, I think. And uh, so we won't have anything until next Wednesday. Okay? All right. Have a good weekend.